it cannot be denied that the desecration of the Sabbath in our day is an evil that is assuming alarming proportions. The danger is more than imaginary for you and for me who are Christian pilgrims sojourning through this foreign land. The danger for you and for me is that we defile our garments and that we adopt the habits and the customs of this world. And there are many causes and circumstances that have arisen to aggravate this danger, this danger of desecrating the Sabbath day. One of the dangers has arisen is this, that there is a certain economic prosperity in which we all live. Now, yes, I know that the world at large right now, and perhaps especially the EU nations, are in dire financial straits. But when we look at our own possessions, and when we look at how much we really do have, and how prosperous we really are, the temptation is for you and for me that there be a spirit of worldly mindedness uh, for us to be enamored with, with possessions, to be uh, enamored with things, and for us to engage ourselves in all kinds of worldly entertainment and worldly amusement because after all, we have the money, we have the means, why not enjoy everything that the world has to offer? And so it's no small wonder then that with such a spirit of frivolous, world-seeking, and materialism, that the Sabbath is no longer remembered by many. And the desecration of the Sabbath day has become very customary. But in the second place, the danger of desecrating the Sabbath is very real for us. Because by nature, I know it, and you know it, the, the, the reality is, is that by nature, we don't want to keep the Sabbath day. And when we hear the fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, we bristle against that word of God. And we don't want to, by nature, adhere to any of God's commandments. That's why we find it very difficult to lead a Christian life, because we have that old man of sin which says, don't follow God's law, don't obey Him, but yet we also have the Spirit of God living within us that tells us the right thing to do. But we know that it's so very difficult to keep the commandments and especially this fourth commandment because when the Sabbath would roll around by nature, we, we, we all would say in our hearts, Ah, yes, finally a day has come that I can do my own pleasure and that I can do my own things and that now I can sweep in and I can uh, fix up things around the house and I can... I, I can tie up loose ends, a, a, a day, a spare day that I can devote to myself and that I can advance my cause. And if that is our attitude toward the Sabbath day, then not only do we show by that kind of an attitude that we despise God's law, but it also shows that we despise the Lord Jesus Christ himself, because after all, the Bible says that the Sabbath is the Lord's day. It's not my day to do as I please. It's not your day to do as, your, your, as you please, but it's the Lord's day. And we'll explain what that means for you and for me in the course of the lecture as well. And so the purpose of the lecture this evening is for us to see the true significance of the Sabbath day, because throughout this country, well, you might say, Pastor, you've only been here for a week, how can you know? It's the same place all over the world, whether it's in the States, whether it's here in the Republic, whether it's on uh, the mainland, the reality is, is that throughout the country and the world, Sunday is a day for sports and for recreation 
and for pleasure and for amusement and for conducting one's business, even by those who say that they adhere to the law of God, which law of God includes the fourth commandment. But the Sabbath was not ordained for recreation, not for pleasure seeking, not only a day that I can rest from my ordinary labor throughout the week, uh, and that I can finally have a day to spend with my family. Now surely that is commendable to, to want to desire to spend time with one's family. But the chief purpose of the Sabbath is not even that we rest from our daily toil and labor. I say the Sabbath is more than that. The chief uh, purpose of the Sabbath is that we should, on this day, be occupied exclusively with things heavenly and with things spiritual, that it might have a sanctifying influence on our whole life, Monday through Saturday, throughout the week, and that in properly observing the Sabbath day, we might have a foretaste of the eternal rest that is to come for the eternal Sabbath. And so I ask you, is that your desire to properly understand and to observe the Sabbath day? Uh, do you keep the Sabbath day? Or perhaps let me back up. Do you know how to keep the Sabbath day? And so let's start in the Old Testament, and let's make our way to the New Testament. Uh, it won't take long. Uh, we'll go through some of the, 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 the verses that apply to the topic at hand. Let's go all the way back to the beginning of creation and examine the seventh day. Now, we read from Genesis chapter 2, the first three verses. The first chapter of Genesis, we know, is the creation of God, how God created all things. And now, in Genesis chapter 2, verses 1, 2, and 3, we read this. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them, and now on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which God created and made. On the seventh day, God rested. And that, as a matter of fact, is, is literally what Sabbath means. Sabbath means to rest. Now, to rest does not mean to be idle, does not mean to be lazy, does not mean that we plop down on the couch and that we, we sleep the whole day away. That's not what it means to rest. But let's look what this word rest means. When God rested on the seventh day, what did he do? There was not only a cessation of activity, but there was also something positively that God did when he rested. And that, what God did, well, it comes out for us in Genesis 2, one first, uh, in the first three verses there. In the first place, that God rested means that he ceased from his work of creating. Right. Now, understand, God did not cease from all of his work. Because we know from the Gospel according to John, John chapter 5, verse 17, Jesus says, My Father worketh hitherto, and I work. That was in connection with a miracle that Jesus performed on the Sabbath day. And Jesus says, uh, the Pharisees accused them of, of blaspheming and of not keeping the Sabbath. And Jesus says, My Father worketh hitherto, and I work. God does work. From a certain point of view, God works 
in his work of providence. He is constantly upholding and sustaining the creation. Uh, that, that's what we call his work of providence. That's not something that God ceases to do on the Sabbath day, but God continues to work from that point of view. And so, from a certain point of view, yes, we, we understand God is a working God, but now on the seventh day of creation, when God rested, it means that God ceased from His work of creating. He was done with it. There's no more creating because He had created everything. But now, but now that He rested, not only means that He ceased from His work of creating, but positively, God delighted in the works that He accomplished. That was work that God did, well, we may say on the seventh day, but it was, uh, he, he rested, he, he took delight in everything that he, he made. It was as it were, he stood back and he saw his beautiful, lovely creation with the pinnacle of his creation being man, made in his own image. And God took great delight and he said, behold, it is very good. And this seventh day of the creation week was intended to be the pattern for the structure of the life for His people. By resting, God instituted the observance of the day of rest. He instituted that one day of the weekly seven days of the week to be set aside as a day of rest. For his people. Now we know that because Genesis chapter 2, verse 3. Well, how do we know that the Sabbath day was set aside? We know that because Genesis chapter 2, verse 3 says that God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Alright? Remember that word, he sanctified it. And now when we go to the fourth commandment of the law of God, which we read, part of that law says this, Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. God sanctified the Sabbath day. God hallowed the Sabbath day. Now, now what does that mean? When, when God sanctifies something, when God hallows something, well, to sanctify and to, to, to hallow, Put it in very easy terms, it means to set something aside for a particular use. Uh, now, think of this, we don't use this language nowadays, but say if there was a young man, he goes out and he gets to a local shop here in the town center and he buys a brand new suit, uh, however many hundreds of euros, a brand, nice brand new suit costs. Does he wear that suit? When he goes to work, he's a mechanic at the local garage. Does he wear that suit when he's working out in the garden? Uh, the obvious answer is, well, no. He doesn't wear those. He only wears it for special occasions, whether it's going to church on Sunday, whether it's for some formal event now to help us understand what sanctify and hallow means. Well, we don't use this language, but that young man has set aside that suit. He has sanctified it. He has hallowed it. And he's put it aside for a special use. Now, that is the Sabbath day. God hallowed it. God sanctified it. He set it apart from the other six days of the week. And the special use is resting. And so the Sabbath of creation is the root or the basis of the weekly Sabbath which is commanded in the fourth commandment. And on this day, the one day out of seven, God sets apart for a special use by us. And on this day, we are to cease from all our earthly labors so that in order we may delight ourselves in the work of God. 
Now you see the, the, the similarity, you see the analogy here. God worked six days and then he ceased from his labor. And he took delight in all the works of his hands. Well, that, that's our calling too. We cease from our ordinary labor and on the Sabbath day we delight ourselves in the work of God. But it's not that we go out and take a nice drive out into the country and, be, and, and take in the beauty of God's creation. It's not delighting ourselves in the beauty of God's earthly creation, but rather we delight ourselves in His recreative work in Jesus Christ. In the salvation that He has given unto us, we delight ourselves and rest in the work of Jesus Christ. Now, we're going to make our way through some more of the Old Testament very, very quickly. In the Old Testament, God's people were called to enter into the rest of the Sabbath. When we look at Adam, Adam was called to enter into that rest because six days God worked and on the seventh day God rested. Well, that was to be the pattern for Adam as well. Six days he labored, and on the seventh day he rested in God's work. On, on the seventh day, the Sabbath day, Adam did not till the ground, but he rested in the work of God. He knew it was a special day set apart from the other days, and Adam and Eve enjoyed the glorious work of God. But we all know what happened next. The fall into sin. And Adam did not enjoy that rest for long. Because he sinned, he was thrust out of the garden, and now he must labor with blood, sweat, and tears, tilling the ground. And this points out that there was a better rest for the people of God. Now as we make our way through the Old Testament, Throughout the rest of the Old Testament, God comes to Israel through the Ten Commandments and calls the people to keep the Sabbath day. And if we look at Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 15. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 15. We read in that verse, And remember that thou wast a servant in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord thy God brought thee out thence through a mighty hand and by a stretched out arm. Therefore, the Lord thy God commanded thee to keep the Sabbath day. And now notice that there is some progress and there is some development going on here. They were to keep the Sabbath day, not only because God rested, but because God delivered the Israelites out of the land of Egypt. He, he brought them out of the house of bondage, and we you know our Bible history. In, in, in the land of Egypt, they were slaves. They were at the mercy of Pharaoh, and he treated them cruelly, and he killed them, and their lives were miserable. That's a picture of the bondage of sin. And now God led them into the land of Canaan. He delivered them out of that miserable bondage. And in the land of Canaan, they delighted themselves in the work of God. They looked back on what God did for them. He brought us out of the land of Egypt. We were so miserable. Our lives were terrible. God delivered us, and look what He gave us. He gave us the land of Canaan. He gave us everything here. We didn't even dig these own wells. We didn't build these houses. We didn't plant these olive trees. He gave it all to us. He delivered us. And so we're commanded to keep the Sabbath day. And in the land of Canaan, they entered into the Sabbath rest of Jehovah. 
They, because God gave them a taste of rest, even his own covenant life and fellowship. But the Sabbath that the Israelites enjoyed in Canaan was only a type. It was only a picture. It wasn't the, the final reality that God would give to his people, but it pointed ahead to a better day when the rest that God would give his people would be full and be complete. Because we know in the Old Testament, the land of Canaan was a type, it was a picture, there were so many sacrifices, there were so many rules, there were so many regulations governing the life of Israel, and all of this proclaimed loudly that there is a better rest for the people of God. And so the reality is the New Testament Sabbath. On this day, we enter into the rest of Jehovah God. Uh, and we enter especially into the rest of the perfect and complete work of Jesus Christ. Well, let's ask, what is that work of Jehovah God? The, the, the type of rest that we enter into. And that work of God is this. It's the complete and finished work of Jesus Christ. And let me demonstrate that from Scripture, from Hebrews chapter 4. The passage which we read, because uh, you cannot understand the Sabbath day properly unless you are grounded in the truth revealed to us in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. Because in, in verse 9, we read this, Hebrews 4, verse 9, There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. This is the rest into which Jesus Christ takes his people. And then notice verse 10, He that is entered into his rest, that's Jesus Christ gone up to glory. He also hath ceased from his works as God did from his. Now that's telling us that just as in the Old Testament that God finished his work of creation after those six days and on the seventh day he, he rested from those works, it also tells us then that likewise Jesus Christ has ceased we may say from his work, and he has entered into the rest of heaven. And what is that work that Jesus Christ well, ceased? Well, it, it was his work of redemption that he perfectly, once and for all, accomplished on the cross. And so on the Sabbath day, we enjoy especially this redemptive work of Jesus Christ and the riches of salvation that we have in Him. We rest. Remember what that word Sabbath means. It means to rest. That's what we do. We rest in the perfect and complete work of Jesus Christ. We enjoy the forgiveness of sins. We take great delight in the righteousness of God that he has imputed unto us, and we take pleasure in fellowship with God, knowing that he is our Savior in Jesus Christ. So that's the idea behind the Sabbath day. Now, let's ask this question. What about our observance of the Sabbath day? Now I have in mind that the Sabbath day in the Old Testament was on Saturday. But we celebrate the Sabbath on the first day of the week. Uh, what is the explanation behind that? Well, uh, it's not the case that the fourth commandment, which says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, it's not the case that the, sap, that the fourth commandment was simply confined to the Old Testament. 
and that that fourth commandment only applied to the life of Israel, but that now in the New Testament, well, we do away with the fourth commandment and we can really call any day that we want the Sabbath day. No, the fourth commandment is still binding upon New Testament Christians. The fourth commandment declares unto us that one day out of seven is uh, to be sanctified, to be hallowed, and to be observed in a different way. The fourth commandment is still in effect today, and by the fourth commandment, God still demands of you and me that we exhibit a certain godly behavior as well. Now we know that in the Old Testament, the Sabbath day was the seventh day, Saturday. That's when, to use that language, Israel worshipped God. They did that on Saturday. But now in the New Testament, that day has been changed to the first day of the week, Sunday. And notice... The church did not change the Sabbath day from the seventh day of the week to the first day of the week. Uh, the church does not have that authority and does not have that liberty. After all, this is the Lord's day. And it's not the case that the church did this at all. The Sabbath is the institution of God. God is the only one who may change the day. And God changed the day in the resurrection of Jesus Christ on the first day of the week. Jesus Christ arose from the dead early Sunday morning. And God, in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, powerfully declares that Jesus has obtained rest. There was God's seal of approval on the work of Jesus Christ by His resurrection from the dead. And now, in Christ's resurrection, our Savior is declared the rest giver who can and will give rest to the people of God. And so, in the New Testament, the day the church assembles, to worship God is on the Sabbath day, which is the first day of the week, Sunday. And we know that because, as I already mentioned, Jesus Christ arose from the dead on the first day of the week. But in the second place, from the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 1, verse 10. Revelation 1, verse 10, just from a simple phrase of Scripture, but a phrase which tells us so much about the Sabbath day, the Apostle John says that he was in the Spirit, now notice, on the Lord's day. He was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Now, that all by itself, indicates to us that there is one day out of seven that is set apart for a special use. It is the Lord's day. Every day isn't the Lord's day, but here he refers to one specific day. Well, what day is that? In light of the emphasis of the preaching of the apostles and of the whole testimony of the New Testament, the Lord's Day is, the, is Sunday, the day that Jesus arose from the dead. And further, Acts chapter 20, verse 7, tells us that the people of God gathered together on the first day of the week. And so Sunday is the Sabbath for the New Testament Christian. Now we who are the people of God are required to delight in the Sabbath day. And this has to be obvious from all our activity 
and all our behavior on the Sabbath day. And so now I'm going to talk about the, the, our observance of the Sabbath day and our activity on the Sabbath day. And notice from a negative point of view, there are certain activities which are forbidden us to perform on the Sabbath day. Uh, the prophet Isaiah speaks of this in Isaiah chapter 58. Isaiah chapter 58. Uh, I'm going to be focusing uh, for a few moments on those two verses, the last two verses in the chapter, verses 13 and 14. But let's read verse 13 right now. Well, both verses. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shall honor him, now notice, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words, then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth, and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. But notice from verse 13, what the prophet Isaiah forbids to be done on the Sabbath day. Uh, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words. Now, uh, Isaiah 58, verse 13, it mentions twice the seeking of one's own pleasure. He's not being redundant, but he repeats this for emphasis. Now, what are those kinds of pleasures that the prophet Isaiah is speaking of? Well, there are two ways that it's possible for us to seek our own pleasure. Well, in the first place, verse 13 says, Doing thine own ways. This is something that is forbidden. On the Sabbath day, we may not do our own ways. Now, now what does that mean? Well, that means as reference to our daily occupation, our daily work, the things that normally occupy our time throughout the week. And whatever that work may be, whether we are a teacher, whether we are a professor, whether we labor in the super, whatever type of labor it is, the Bible says we have to put away doing our own ways and on Sunday we put that work aside. Apart from works of necessity, apart from works of mercy, uh, we, all work is forbidden. We may and we must work on the first six days of the week, but on the seventh, well, on the Sabbath day, Sunday, work is forbidden. Now, in the second place, uh, how is it possible that we seek our own pleasure? Isaiah 58, verse 13 says, Speaking thine own words, that's something that's forbidden us as well. Because if we are to delight ourselves in the Sabbath, well, this involves our speech as well. And we delight in the Sabbath day, now from a negative point of view, by not speaking our own words. Now, now what does it mean to speak our own words on the Sabbath day? Well, it's the, it's the kind of, of idle talk and chatter and, and, and chit-chat which really has nothing to do with God. It's the kind of talk that completely forgets about God and, and pushes God aside and simply talks about frivolous things, unimportant things, things that have absolutely nothing at all to do with our Christian walk and our Christian confession. Now, 
This doesn't mean that we're not to speak on the Sabbath day at all. Uh, of course we are to speak. But we're not to speak our own words. But we must speak the words of God. And all our speech must be holy and dignified and sanctified. Our speech must be centered in the word that is preached, in the word that is read. But specifically, delighting ourselves is avoiding all our own pleasure. That's what Isaiah 58 verse 13 is, is, is hammering home to us. Put away all your self-seeking pleasure and amusement and recreation. And notice the repetition there in verse 13. Not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words. When you wake up on Sunday morning, is the first thing that you say is this. Finally, a day for me. A day that I can do what I want to do because I did set aside enough time earlier in the week, and now I am going to do it on Sunday, a day in which I can seek my own interests and do my own pleasure. And now the Word of God says to us this, don't seek your own pleasure. Don't seek uh, your own advancement. Uh, but rather, our thoughts must be centered upon the Lord. After all, this is the Lord's day, and what we speak and what we do and everything else that fills up the day must be centered and focused upon God and upon the work that God has done in Jesus Christ in giving us rest from all our sins. Well then, how then do we properly observe the Sabbath? We just spoke at length about what we're not to do. Don't seek your own pleasure. Don't speak your own words. That's the word of the Bible to us. Don't do those things. But now, what are we to do? Well, Isaiah 58 verse 13 speaks about delighting in the Sabbath and calling it a delight. And we delight in the Sabbath when we rest in the perfect work of Jesus Christ. How are we to do that? Well, it's by going to church and by hearing the gospel that you are saved not by anything that you have done, but by the work of Jesus Christ. That's resting in the work of Jesus Christ. That is delighting in the work that he has accomplished. And so, the basic thing for Sabbath observance is that the believer hears and believes the gospel of justification by faith alone, by grace alone. And that comes out for us in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 10. Now, there's, there's something here in Hebrews 4, that's easy for us to overlook with regard to our enjoyment of rest. Here in Hebrews 4, verse 10. Uh, verse 10 says this, He that is entered into his rest, he also, also hath ceased from his own works. God ceased from his own works and he rested on the Sabbath day and Sabbath observance for us involves our ceasing from our own works. All right? Now that doesn't mean so much that on the Sabbath day we don't work and that we don't do our normal occupation that we do throughout the other six days of the week, but rather it means that in our heart we lay aside all self-righteousness and all our own works, and that we 
may rest in the spiritual work of Jesus Christ for us. You see, ceasing from our own works, yes, it does apply to our physical labor, but it also applies spiritually. We don't try and work for our salvation uh, so that we do something as a condition upon which God would give us salvation. We cease from all our self-righteous works and we submit ourselves to the will of God and we rest only in Jesus Christ. And now that, that tells us something. That tells us that the great threat to Sabbath observance really isn't so much when people work their physical jobs on the Sabbath day. Well, that is a threat to Sabbath observance, but that really isn't the greatest threat to Sabbath observance. But rather, the greatest threat is that when people go to church and hear a message on the Sabbath day that you must work for your salvation, that you must perform a condition upon which God will grant you salvation. Because that, that's, that's not ceasing from our own works. That's working for our salvation. And so the grossest desecration is that conditional salvation. There might be people all over the world. There might be people who go to church faithfully twice every Sunday. There may be people who don't do an ounce of work on Sunday, and yet the preaching of the gospel that they sit under says, you have to do something for your salvation. And if you don't do it, then God won't give you salvation. It's up to you. The, the ball's in your court, and you have to work for it. That is, I say, the grossest type of Sabbath desecration. Hearing the gospel, the false gospel, of conditional salvation. But rather, the chief celebration on the Sabbath day is frequenting the house of God, ceasing from our own labors. Physical labors, yes, but ceasing from all, all our works of self-righteousness and pride and throwing ourselves upon the cross of Jesus Christ and saying, I am thine. I have been bought with thy precious blood. Save me, because I can't save myself. But now, what may be surprising is that we delight in the Sabbath day not just by our activities on Sunday, but, rather, but also throughout the entire week as well. Uh, don't understand the fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, that it just applies to Sunday, so that when I wake up on Sunday morning, I say, well, now the fourth commandment applies to me. I've got to remember the Sabbath day, but that when I wake up on Monday morning and throughout the week, I can say, that fourth commandment, well, that's only for Sunday. That really doesn't apply to me now. Uh, Sunday worship is not just for Sunday, but the purpose of what we do on Sunday is for every other week of the day as well. Think of Sunday as a training center so that we go out into the world so that we are trained and that we are encouraged and that we are able to wage the warfare uh, of a dutiful Christian soldier. And so what we do on Sunday permeates our whole life because after all, our whole life is a dedication to God. And we're concerned about the fourth commandment every single day of the week. Not just when we wake up on Sundays, but when we wake up on Monday. The first thing we say is this, ah yes, God has commanded me, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. 
Just as you put away your physical labor on the Sabbath, so ought you all the days of your life cease from sin. On Monday morning, you wake up and you remember that just yesterday I came into contact with the Word of God that I heard in the preaching of the Gospel. And He encouraged me and He gave me His words and He gave me His grace and now I'm going to go forth in the rest of this week in the power of His might and the power that I heard on this Sabbath day. And so, as you go forth throughout the week in all your labors, go forth in the power of the risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That is delighting in the Sabbath day, not just on Sunday, but every day of the week as well. And when we delight ourselves in the Sabbath day, we have the promise that God will bless us. Now, here's where I want to turn your attention once again to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 58. Uh, we already looked at verse 13. But let's look at verse 14 here finally this evening. When we delight ourselves on the Sabbath day, God gives unto us a very grand and beautiful promise. And the promise is this. I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father. It's a beautiful promise. Uh, now what did this mean for the Israelites when they heard this in the Old Testament? I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth. Well, when they heard these words, they immediately thought back to Deuteronomy chapter 32 because these words that the prophet Isaiah speaks were the very same words that Moses spoke to the people right before they entered into the land of Canaan. And Moses said unto them, God will cause you to ride upon the high places of the earth. And when the Israelites heard these words, I'll, I'll cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth. That brought forth the image of a, of, of a mighty soldier, a conqueror who is on his, his stallion and he's going forth to conquer. And he goes to the enemy's strongholds and to their high places and to their citadels and to their fortresses. And he conquers those high places and he subjects them to his own dominion. Uh, and so now Isaiah is speaking to Israel, when you keep the Sabbath day, when you don't do your own works, but when you delight in the work of God, then God will cause you to ride upon the high places. And that's as much to say, God will cause you to be victorious. And then Isaiah continues, and he will feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father. When they delight themselves in the Sabbath day, here's the promise God says, I'll give you the heritage of Jacob. What was the heritage of Jacob for the Israelites? It was the land of Canaan. What is the heritage of Jacob for us? Not that little sliver of land along the Mediterranean Sea, but it's the heavenly Canaan because Canaan is a picture of heaven and when we keep the Sabbath day and in our delighting in the Sabbath day God will feed us with the heritage of heaven and so delighting ourselves in the Sabbath day uh, God will give unto us all those things and then finally this our enjoyment of this promise is not only in the future when we go to heaven. Sometimes we might be tempted to think, ah yes, heaven, the eternal rest that God will give me. I don't have it yet, but there is coming a day in my life when I die when I will inherit heaven. Yes, 
that is true. And then you and I will inherit that perfect rest. But know this as well. In this life, we also enjoy a foretaste of that rest which is ours in heaven. Every single Sabbath day, we have a foretaste of what heaven will be like and of what types of joys and, and delights will be ours there. Because even on the Sabbath day, when we hear the preaching of the gospel, we hear the words of Jesus Christ unto us. I love you, my people. I shed my blood for you. You are my people. And now, every Sabbath day, we get a taste of heaven because we hear the word of the gospel. We hear the word exposited to us from the Holy Bible. And we say, give me more. I want more preaching. I want to experience more and more a foretaste of heaven. And then we find ourselves not only longing for Sunday each and every week so that we can receive more grace and that we can hear more of the preaching of the gospel, but then we also find ourselves that we begin to long more and more for the eternal rest which God will give unto us in heaven in that day when he takes us to be with him in glory. And so that is the Sabbath day. Uh, very short lecture about the Sabbath day, many other aspects uh, of the Sabbath day as well. But may God work in our hearts to honor and sanctify the Sabbath day. And with that, uh, I'd like to open up the floor. Do you have any questions about I just have Sam. one. Yes. Uh, you said people of Ireland, and then you said the mainland. Where's the mainland? When I said the mainland, I referred to the continent. Continent? The Europe. Europe. Oh, yeah? And I didn't the Netherlands that. and Germany. How did you make that up? Uh, you know what? In um, I think it was in my study of history, sometimes we refer to the continental history and then to the history that is taking place here in the British Isles. But, but this is the British Isles. I believe so. I'm willing to I be instructed. Right. No, yes. it's not this British Isles, but not Ireland. It's, it's a bit off topic. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm willing to be instructed on that. Yeah. All right, good. You should know that, no, man. Anybody else? Uh, uh, Terry. Um, in, in Hebrews uh, chapter 4, verse 7, I know it wasn't covered specifically, but it probably has a bearing on the topic. It says, again, he limited a certain day. Um, is it possible to explain what the writer is referring to there when he says, again, he limited a certain day, saying in David? And the quotes from Psalm 95. Mm -hmm. Let's turn to that. Psalm 95 or 7 is where he's quoting from. He's added, uh, the, the writer to the Hebrews has in mind especially that last phrase in verse 7 and then going on in verse 8 today if ye will hear his voice harden not your heart as in the day of provocation as in the day of temptation in the wilderness and then in Hebrews 4 verse 7 the we read today again he limited a certain day saying in David today after so long time harden not your hearts. And the thrust of what Hebrews 4 verse 7 is saying is that he's referring back to the Old Testament, to the book of Psalms, to David, and is simply pointing out that there is a day 
Now, the book of Psalms doesn't say exactly what day, but it says that there is a day. Today, harden not your hearts, uh, as in the provocation when they tempted God, or tempted Moses, uh, God in the wilderness, when there was no food, was no water. Uh, but Psalm 95, verse 7 is the basis. But right now, suffice it to say that he's, he's limiting a certain day. Every day of the week is in the Sabbath, is in the Sabbath. but there is one day of the week. That's a that's a very difficult verse. That's a that requires a. We've had we've had a number of lectures, sermons on the Sabbath day. Have you? But what's very evident from tonight is that we've had many many more. There are so many different aspects to it. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So it's a very rich area. Mm hmm. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, well, look, before I say some more things, I guess, uh, are there any other questions? Manuel? Yeah, um, more of a practical question. Um, I'm sure it has happened before that some believers have, um, have not been able to find work because they refuse to work on the Lord's Day. I was wondering, what is the? Is there anything that a reformed church can do to help such um, believers? To what, what is kind of from a practical point of view? What can a church do? <laughs> Say, if, if that fam if that family is you know uh, in great difficulties financially because mm -hmm. of, because of that. All right, because somebody perhaps. Is not willing to work on the Sabbath day, and because of their holding to the to the, the fourth commandment, that they can't find work. Yeah. Yep. That goes to show us that we first of all we obey the word of God. The word of God says, "Cease from your own works." <coughs> Apart from works of necessity and works of mercy, uh, I'll speak to that in a bit. All work is forbidden, and if a man or a woman Father, mother, and they have many children, and they find that because they hold to the fourth commandment, to the word of God, that they are not able to find work on the Sabbath day. For one thing, uh, they are being persecuted for righteousness' sake. But for another thing, uh, the church, the individual members, can either help that man find a job, but in a church, usually that man also can go to the deacons. And if he needs help financially, there are the mercies of Jesus Christ to take care of that family. And such a family should not be ashamed at all to go to the deacons of the church and to request those mercies. Say there are certain professions where their work is a work of necessity. Doctors, nurses, soldiers. If the enemy attacks on the Sabbath day, surely I have to fight the enemy. Mm -hmm. I think I put that in the necessity. There are certain things which the Lord allows us to do. Otherwise we'd have no army. We'd have no doctors. So, mm -hmm. it, how does that fit in? Yep, we have to make sure that when the Bible tells us that cease from your labors, we understand that to mean that we don't work on the Sabbath day. But we don't take the extreme position and say every bit of work that I could possibly conceive of yeah. is forbidden. Because I brought that verse up, John chapter 5. Jesus says, My Father worketh hitherto, and I work. Now that tells us that the rule is don't work. But there are exceptions to that rule. The Bible gives those exceptions. And this, thank you for asking that question. I was going to elaborate on this a little bit earlier. But if you turn to Luke chapter 14, that's where Jesus gives unto us more instruction. Luke chapter 14, verse 
Well, if you look at verses 1 and 2, the Pharisee who came to him on the Sabbath day, and they watched Jesus heal man. And then in verse 3, Jesus answering, spake unto the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? Jesus healed a man on the Sabbath day. And from a certain point of view, he, he worked on the Sabbath day. And the Pharisees recognize that at work, and they say, You may do that. But Jesus says, Well, by the very fact that Jesus did do it, tells us that works of charity, works of mercy, whether it be doctors or nurses, that type of work is allowed. It doesn't mean that we actively go out and pursue uh, to be a doctor so that we can work on Sunday and so we don't have to go to the preaching. Of course not. But that's allowed nevertheless. Now, in the very next verse, um, well, in verse 5, Jesus gives us a little bit more instruction about working on the Sabbath. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Which of you shall have an ass or an ox fallen into a pit and will not straightway pull him out on the Sabbath day? There Jesus is referring to works of necessity. That's the, that, that the owner of that ox, the owner of that ass didn't expect it and he didn't think about it, but his animal fell into the ditch and he needs that animal for the work throughout the week. So on the Sabbath day, he might have to round up two or three more men, he might have to get some equipment and he might have to pull his ox out of the ditch. That's a work of necessity. Uh, he may do that. Now, if your ox falls into the ditch every single Sabbath day, then, then you have a problem. Then, for one, you have to do one of two things. If you find it happening every single Sabbath day, well, then you either got to sell your ox or you got to fill that ditch. Yeah, I'm fence around. <laughs> but nevertheless, Luke 14, verse 5 says that works of necessity are allowed. But remember that the, the, the thrust of the Sabbath day is not, and it's so easy to get distracted. What may I do? What may I not do? If I may do this, how far can I do it? Don't get distracted with, the, with, with that, those kind of things. But the main thrust of the Sabbath day is delighting in the work of Jesus Christ. He merited salvation for us. He gives it unto us. We hear it in the preaching of the gospel. And we rest and delight in the work of Jesus Christ. The Sabbath isn't about what we may do. The Sabbath is all about what I am privileged to do. To serve God. To bless God. To get involved in spiritual activities that I... I couldn't so much throughout the remainder of the week because I was so busy with my other duties. But on the Sabbath day, yes, that is the day that I delight myself in the work of Jesus Christ. All right, uh, yes? Um, we get a good insight through the word that the Lord does take Sabbath keeping very serious indeed. Um, we see an example in 2 Chronicles 36 where um, in verse 20, it says, and then they had escaped from the sword, carried he away to Babylon, where they were servants to him and his sons until the reign of the kingdom of Persia, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, until the land had enjoyed her Sabbath, for as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath, to fulfill the three score and ten years. Now, um, that was because one of the primary sins of Judah and Israel prior to this uh, invasion by Nebuchadnezzar was Sabbath breaking amongst the other sins. And um, going further to Romans 12, um, uh, you know, it talks that we, we um, for if God spared not the natural branches, take heed, lest he also spare not thee. We should take it seriously because if, through unbelief, because uh, not keeping Sabbath, I believe, well, this is something we must reason amongst ourselves. It's, it's a sign of unbelief. And it's not believing that the Lord created.
create that day to be enjoyed uh, as a blessing in our physical life on this earth, but also in Him, in Christ Jesus, for all eternity, who is our, our Lord of Sabbaths. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. The Lord of Sabaoth. Yeah, Sabbath. I don't know. Good. Sabbath. All right. Thank you. That's uh, quite well taken. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have any questions? If not, let's close with a word of prayer.